All right, guys, today let's do something a little bit different. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and uh, I think the time is right to do this. So uh, let's talk about the history of amplifiers, like the, the rock and metal amplifiers, where it all started, and uh, how the amps were geared back when you know they started, and uh, how people used them, how they dialed them in, and all of the things that they had to do to get them to work properly for them in different scenarios, whether it's in the studio, band practice, or playing live. And uh, we're going to go over all that stuff, and we're also going to talk about how amps evolved over the years and why that evolution was necessary. So we're going to cover everything from the early Marshall years and go through the whole 80s thing where there was the modded Marshalls and all the amplifiers that came from that. And then we're going to end up at the current day modern metal amplifiers and how they differ from their predecessors. Let's get started. Well, thanks for joining me for today's episode. And like I said in the intro, this is a pretty unique topic. I haven't covered anything like this on the channel. Now, I've done some research on this and put a lot of effort into it. So I hope you guys really get something out of it. I know I sure did when I was doing my research. And honestly, I've lived part of this as well. Like I grew up in the 80s. So, you know, Marshall JCM amplifiers were freaking everywhere when I was growing up. So they were pretty much on every album that I listened to. So I'm very familiar with the topic, but uh, I haven't played many JCM 800s. So it's kind of cool to reintroduce myself to one of these and uh, do some dial-ins and stuff like that in the video for you as well. So. Hang in there, we'll get to all the subjects. And uh, before we do though, I wanna just go over some housekeeping really quick. First of all, I wanna thank Matt Forrest for allowing me to take his amplifier home so that I can do these episodes for you guys. I really appreciate that very much. And uh, Matt's a good friend, a great dude, and I, I've learned a lot from him as well. Another thing is, if you do like what I do here on the channel, please give it a like. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do and click the bell so that you can be notified every time I come out with new episodes. Basically what I do here is I dial in a bunch of high gain amplifiers, I do digital gear as well, and I give you unprocessed audio. So there's no processing on anything. I give you the raw amp tones and the raw tones that I get from any of the digital platforms as well so that you can hear exactly what they sound like and make the best decision for you. I also have a website, ToneWars.com, where I sell quad cortex captures, Tonex captures, and Kemper profiles. So if you like brutal high gain tones and really nice cleans, go to my website and get some profiles for yourself right now for any one of those units. All right, on with the video. Okay, so back in the day when bands were starting to tour and perform live in front of audiences, uh, you know, basically they didn't have the PAs that we have today. They didn't have the subwoofers and the digital boards and, you know, the mid-range speakers, the, the woofers and the tweeters and the, all the stuff that everybody has, the flying arrays. You know, they didn't have all that stuff back then. I mean, basically a PA back then was either like for speaking engagements, for public speaking at gymnasiums or even at... Uh, you know, some smaller venues like amphitheaters and stuff like that, or, you know, table two, your pizza's ready. I mean, that's basically what a PA was back then. So they didn't really design them for touring bands. So basically bands would show up at a venue and just perform through whatever they had there and just make do with it. So typically the vocalist got to use the microphone and everybody else just played through their, their amplifiers and uh, the drums were pretty much just heard acoustically. And they just had to keep up with uh, the, the size of the venue, each other, and the crowd noise as well. And back then, amphitheaters were a big deal because they were designed to project the sound forward in such a way that it amplified the sound. That's why they called them amphitheaters. Anyways, uh, so because the guitar players, especially, and we're talking about guitar players in this video and guitar gear, uh, because the guitar players wanted to keep up with the, you know, the demands of filling a venue full of their sound and making sure everybody could hear them, and they wanted to keep up with the PA that was projecting the vocals, they needed amplifiers that would be loud enough to do that. Problem was, when they cranked up their amplifiers, uh, they 
A, a lot of them weren't loud enough, and B, when they cranked them, they sounded like shit. <laughs> they just fell apart at the loud volumes. So they basically went to Jim and Terry Marshall and said, hey, we need amplifiers that are going to be super freaking loud, but they're also going to sound good when they're loud. So Marshall started creating amplifiers for these guys so that when they cranked them at concert volume levels, they sounded amazing. And so they, they were geared to sound good when you turn them up and turn them up super loud. And everybody was happy because they were like, there we go. Now we can keep up with the demands associated with touring and be loud enough for everybody. And uh, this is amazing. So that worked for many years for these guys. But the, the problem was when they got in studios, <laughs> The studio engineers wanted to wring their necks because they went in there with these cranked amplifiers and studio engineers are like, guys, you're blowing our mics. I mean, micro some microphones are very delicate, ribbon mics and stuff like that. Very delicate. You could blow those things up uh, pretty easily if you have too much SPLs going into them. And they're not cheap, obviously. So studio engineers were having, you know, these huge arguments with the guitar players because they were like, you know, you can't turn your amp up that high. And the guitar players were like, yeah, but I need to have it that high for it to sound good because it's geared that way. The gain stage in a lot of those amplifiers wasn't just in the preamp section, it was in the power section. So you would get a certain amount of gain in the preamp section, but as soon as you crank the volume in the power amp section, it kind of gave you that growl and more gain that you were looking for. And for rock and roll back then, that's what they wanted. Now, they don't compete with the high gain amps of today, but for what they needed back then, they were perfect at those volumes. So they had to find a solution for that, and basically what that was was the Variac. So basically they would uh, attenuate the amplifiers so they could crank them, but the attenuator would take the volume down to the speaker so that uh, you could have a cranked amp without all of the volume associated with cranking it. So that was a pretty nice compromise for the studios, and that's how they got around all that. I mean, Eddie Van Halen did it, Randy Rhodes did it. I mean, a lot of guys did it back in the, uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Now, at this time, because concerts were becoming uh, more and more common with rock bands anyways, uh, PA started developing and, and evolving as well. And they got better speakers, they got PAs that weren't just made for, you know, public speaking or table two, your pizza's ready. I mean, they were like, we actually got to start making PAs that are made for, you know, concert venues and for this type of music. So they started adding different kinds of speakers and they also started miking the instruments. They would mic the drums, they would mic the, the bass guitar, they would mic the uh, guitar cabinets uh, for the, you know, rhythm and lead players and stuff like that. So. They had a fuller, bigger, and better sound, but they were still miking super cranked amplifiers that were basically made to sound, you know, to be loud enough without the PA, but now we're slapping mics in front of them, not only in the studio, but in a live situation. So now we had another problem where it was like, oh, great, now my super loud amps that were once appropriate for this type of setting are now not fitting the setting at all, and I'm fighting with live engineers and you know on top of the studio engineers. So what did they do? Well, they started bringing their you know their attenuators with them on tour, and what a pain in the ass that is, right? Not only do you got to bring all these amps, but now you got to bring attenuators and attenuate everything and all that. So that was a giant pain, and uh, that went on for years. But then they had to go back to Marshall and say, well. <laughs> Now we need you to gear these amplifiers so uh, they sound good at a lower volume. So whatever you have to do to make that happen, you need to work on that because uh, this, this whole Variac thing on tour is just not working out. It's just a pain in the ass and it's just one more thing to go wrong and to maintain while we're touring. So before I go on to the next segment, what I'm going to do is show you basically uh, a JCM 800 that I have hooked up to the Oxbox, which has an attenuator on it. And uh, let's go ahead and listen to what that sounds like right now. I also have a boost pedal because back in the 80s, a lot of guys would set their amps up this way. They would boost it with uh, a tube screamer and uh, attenuate it so they can get that, that sound that they're looking for. So let's go ahead and see how that sounds. Uh, I have the attenuator right now on 
uh, four. So it's on four, so it's one notch down. It's pretty freaking loud in here, but it allows me to actually turn the volume up pretty high here so that I can get the, uh, the gain and the, the rage from the amplifier that I need uh, to you know get that sound that everybody's looking for in the early 80s. So let's hear what that sounds like now. And we're gonna start with the overdrive pedal off. Okay, that actually sounds pretty freaking good. It sounds a lot better than when I did uh, a review of this amplifier several days ago when I had the volume down quite a bit lower because I didn't have it hooked up to the uh, attenuator. So now let's engage the boost and see what we have. All right, so sounds a lot meaner. So I'm gonna show you how I have the amp dialed in. But before I do that, I'm gonna tell you my settings on the boost pedal. So I have the drive at probably about 10 o'clock. I have the volume or level at about almost three o'clock and I have the tone in the middle. So let's take a look at the amp now. All right, so I want a little more bite. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the tone knob up just a little bit on uh, the overdrive and see what we have. Thank you. 
nice little trip down memory lane so i mean those were the tones that we got in uh you know the late late 70s and a lot of the early to mid 80s and uh you know these amplifiers just really did it i mean when you set them up with a variac in a studio and on stage with an overdrive pedal you got uh you got the sound that uh, everybody craved for the 80s and it's just on so many albums and it was in so many concerts i mean it's just an incredible sound. You know what's funny is, you know, obviously, I mean, look at this stuff around me. I'm a high gain fanatic, but the more I played this, the more I was like, man, this is freaking cool. I mean, there's just, there's something really cool about this sound. I mean, it's nostalgic for me because I grew up in the 80s, but honestly, like I was falling in love with this whole setup the more I was playing it. Seriously, because before I started this video and I was dialing everything in, I was kind of like, man, I think people just like these amplifiers for the nostalgia, you know, and, uh, you know, this kind of antiquated and blah, blah, blah. And I had this kind of thing about it in my head, but I get it. <laughs> I mean, I really get it now. Like there's something pretty damn cool about these amplifiers set up the way that they are. And, you know, like with the Variac or some kind of attenuator and an overdrive pedal with these settings and it just there's just something cool about that there really is so i get why people really liked uh this stuff and i get why people still do like this stuff it's kind of like a classic car doesn't handle like as, the, as well as the new cars and is not as comfortable but there's just something really cool about it so i have a lot of respect for this setup i really do it's actually really cool to play now is it something that i would uh tour with or whatever um probably not <laughs> Because it's just not practical, you know, it's just not. It's like taking a 69 Camaro on a family trip. I mean, it's just not practical. It's not good on gas. Where are you going to put your luggage? There's not a lot of leg room in that back seat, and there's no air conditioning. So it's like, um, it's better for like a Sunday drive or just a cruise or something like that on a cool night. I know I used to own one, and it's amazing, but I would never take a family vacation with one. It's just not uh appropriate for that but it doesn't mean that it's not cool so in my opinion this is kind of like the equivalent to a 69 camaro rig you know it's it's cool it's nostalgic not super practical but man is it fun to plug into every once in a while and just get those vibes back and uh enjoy that nostalgic tone and uh actually it's a pretty good feel as well so again i do understand why people like this and i'm and i'm kind of as I'm speaking these words right now, I'm kind of like fighting with myself. Like, I didn't think I'd be saying this, 
But again, the more I played this rig, the more I get it, the more I understand why people actually do like these. And they definitely had their place back in the uh, 70s and 80s, but still cool today. So for this next segment, let's move on to the evolution from where we're at right now, a very act or attenuated Marshall that's cranked with an overdrive in front of it. What came next after that? All right, so now we enter the era of the modded Marshalls. So basically music was evolving and getting heavier and guitarists wanted more saturation and more gain in the amplifiers. And when they geared the Marshalls differently and put more gain in the preamp stage, people really liked that a lot, but they wanted more. So they started going to people like Jose and you know these other guys and getting their Marshalls modded and getting more gain stages and maybe some other tricks you know, put in the uh, the circuit as well. And they started coming out with this heavier stuff. I mean, Neil Sean did it. There's a, a countless other guitar players. I mean, you name the guitar player, he most likely played through a modded Marshall. And just like previous decades where Vox and other companies tried to copy what Marshall was doing with their amplifiers, as far as making them loud and making them sound good at loud volumes, well, now other companies were kind of copying or doing their own version of the modded Marshall, you know, the crazy amount of gain and, uh, you know, stuff like that. I mean, Mesa came out with the Mark series. I mean, the dual Rex, I mean, all that stuff started coming out and there were other companies jumping into the fray, and <laughs> creating their own version of a, of a high gain amplifier that sounded amazing. Now I don't have a modded Marshall here. I don't have, you know, something that Jose modded here, but I do have a version of what someone else's take of a hot rodded Marshall is, and that's the Splon Nitro. And that's one of my favorite amplifiers, and it's basically a hot rodded Marshall, but it's Scott Splon's take on that as well. So just like a lot of other people like Soldano's, I mean, the Soldano was like like the ultra super hot rotted Marshall thing that everybody went after back in the eighties because it was like freaking bombastic as hell, tons of gain. And it was like, you know, highly sought after amplifier. So what I'm going to do for you now is play some riffs for you on the Splon Nitro and I'm boosting it with the, uh, the Mesa grid slammer. I boost all my amps. So it's just the way it is. And so, you know, deal with it. <laughs> um, so anyway, so let's hear what, like, you know, the typical hot rotted, like ridiculous gained up amplifier sounded like back then. And I know the Splons weren't made particularly in the 80s, but again, it's still Scott Splons version of a hot rotted Marshall. So let's go ahead and hear that now. I mean, we have entered like some crazy territory now with these amplifiers. I mean, this is what really evolved music. And, you know, as a guitar player, you play through something like that and hear something that's that gnarly and that heavy and that freaking just full and bombastic. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to write wimpy riffs with it or are you going to write some freaking nasty riffs? I mean, it's just so inspiring to write some amazing heavy riffs with. And that's when people started writing that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, I'll play some of the typical heavy riffs for you from that era right now. <laughs> I mean, the, the tones were just so much meaner and nastier and gnarlier and heavier. 
and there was definitely a lot more gain and saturation going on. And because of that, people really took advantage of that. And like I said earlier, just started writing just heavier riffs and heavier music. And that's when, like the, the like I said, the heavy metal stuff started coming in. And even bands that were, you know, even radio friendly were still heavy as hell. I mean, the riffs that were on a lot of the White Snake albums, especially the big one that they had, were just so freaking heavy and it was just amazing. So it gave birth to bands like Metallica, who used the Mark series amplifiers, and a lot of other heavier bands as well. Judas Priest started uh, writing heavier stuff. So it, the, the whole music genre of heavy metal just evolved in all these different things. and. You know, then out popped all these other, you know, amplifier companies and all these other amps that had higher gain amplifiers and people really just flocked to all of those types of amps. And uh, what a great time it was to have all of that great music and all that great guitar tone that uh, came from the, the modded Marshalls and all of the amplifiers that did their take on the modded Marshalls. I mean, that was kind of the era of the shredders and all that stuff as well. So it was it was really cool. And uh, I really enjoyed that whole era. I'm so glad I grew up around all that stuff because it kind of shaped me as a musician as well. Man, I forgot how nasty this Splon Nitro is. This is a freaking evil amp. Oh my God, it's one of the heaviest amps that I have. It's amazing what you can do with a hot rodded Marshall circuit. I mean, it's just so badass. You know, uh, if you don't have a Splon Nitro, I highly recommend that you get one. And I got the KT88 version, and this thing is just an absolute fire-breathing beast. So like I said, there are plenty of guitar players out there playing modded Marshalls or amplifiers that were made by other amp makers that was, you know, their take on that. And a lot of the amps came, that came out back then were quite different than just a modded Marshall. I mean, the Mark Series amplifiers where in my opinion, just Mesa Boogie just came out with an amazing amplifier. I mean, it wasn't a modded Marshall at all. I mean, it was basically, I don't know where they came up with the idea, but that thing was just sick. And there were a lot of bands playing those as well. And the Dual Rex, yeah, they're a little bit tubby and fizzy, but they still sounded amazing back then. And a lot of people really enjoyed playing those as well. And those amplifiers were on a ton of albums also. So there was just a great variety of tones that we all got to enjoy as listeners and as guitar players back in that era. So now in this next segment, we're going to move into a more modern take of the, uh, the high gain amplifier that took it a step even further, which is like hard to imagine, but they actually did that as well. All right, so now we enter the modern era of amplifiers and amp tones and gain stages and all that happy stuff. And basically, in my opinion, what gave birth to this were two amplifiers, and one of them was the Soldano, and the other one was the PV5150 that was obviously developed with Eddie Van Halen. When that amplifier came out, it just changed everything. It was just such a freaking beast. I mean, it was amazing, and a lot of people really flocked to that kind of amplifier now. And basically what the 5150 did for amp tone is what the Marshalls did in previous decades. I mean, everybody was trying to copy the Marshall circuit and, you know, evolving that into what it became. But then the 5150 became the benchmark that everybody tried to go after and compare their amplifiers to from there. And everybody, everything just pretty much evolved from there because that thing just took it to not just the next level, but probably the next 10 levels. I remember seeing interviews with Joe Satriani and I remember him saying like the first time he experienced one of those, he said it was just this thing just sitting in the corner in the room, just buzzing and just, you know, sizzling and just waiting for him to plug into it. And it was just like, oh my God, what kind of hell is this going to come out of this thing when I start playing through it? And he was blown away by it. So there was a lot of guitar players that really loved that amplifier. And, you know, all the other amp builders took note and they said, well, I guess this is what everybody wants now. So everybody tried to uh, emulate what that had going on, but they also came up with their own version of that, just like everybody did with the Marshalls in previous decades. And that amplifier basically evolved into what you know, the EVH Stealth is today, because Eddie Van Halen was part of that whole evolution up till the Stealth. 
And the Stealth, in my opinion, is the most brutal, ridiculous amplifier I've ever played anyways. There might be something out there that would be more brutal than that, but it's hard to imagine. So let's go ahead and hear what the Stealth sounds like on the red channel, which I think is the most brutal channel on that amplifier. And that's the channel that Eddie gravitated towards when he toured with this amplifier. <laughs> Yeah, that is just unbeatable as far as brutality goes. I mean, that amp is just so freaking sick. I mean, if you go back and listen to the JCM 800 and compare that to the EVH Stealth Red Channel, I mean, it's just like, holy crap, have we just completely gone uh, so far with gain staging and aggression and brutality and just overall tone and everything else in these amplifiers over the, the last several decades. I mean, it's just insane. And things just really have uh, evolved quite a bit. And if you ask me, it's kind of cool. I mean, I prefer the higher gain stuff because they're just nasty, they're gnarly, they're super brutal, and it fits the type of riffs and the type of music that I like to play. I mean, can I play the stuff that I write and stuff like that on uh, the JCM 800? Yeah, but that amplifier just doesn't really suit my particular type of music and riffs that I play. So I prefer something like the EBH Stealth or any of these other amplifiers on my shelves because they, they're just voiced and, uh, you know, gain staged, at least for me, the way I like them. Now, quick little sidebar about this video. There's a ton of information that I could have shared in this video, but I'm trying to keep it short. So there's a lot of names and different things that I've left out on purpose because if I was to put all the information in this video and fill in all the gaps with everything, then this would probably be a three hour video and no one's gonna sit down and watch that. And I sure as hell ain't gonna shoot and edit that much footage. I'm just trying to give you guys a quick footnote kind of video about this topic and I hope you're enjoying it so far. So I'm gonna play a couple more riffs on the uh, EBH Stealth Red Channel just to give you some more ideas of what this amplifier sounds like and uh, I just think it's so much fun to play and it's just extremely brutal and I freaking love it. I'm boosting it with the Oddbox and some of you are probably like why are you boosting the Red Channel? Well it has an Easter egg in it so if you crank the blue channel gain while you're in the red channel, you can forego the boost. But I prefer to use my own boost pedal and set the amp up the way I like it. So I actually have turned the gain quite a bit down on the uh, blue channel. It's probably around 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, right around there. And uh, it rounds out the red channel enough so that when I boost it, it's not overly gnarly. You know, it's just like the perfect setting for me. So anyways, let's play some riffs and uh, see what it sounds like. Thank you. 
Yep, freaking brutal as hell, man. This freaking amplifier is just disgusting. I freaking love it. Oh my God, this is another one of those must-have amplifiers. And it's just, again, it's just amazing how far, you know, amplifiers have evolved since the early Marshalls, like the JMPs and the JCMs. I mean, I just, like I said, I just think it's so freaking cool to, you know, to be able to see the lineage and to hear how different they sound all in one video and uh i hope like i said i hope i gave you guys enough information again i know i left a lot of stuff out but i mean geez i can't do a three hour video so but yeah do, do your own research and you know there's some really good uh videos out there like the history of marshall amps and stuff uh, there's some really good information in that it was just really interesting hearing all of the stories and how the amps were developed and changed over the years for people and i just really enjoyed watching that i probably watched that like three times uh, i watched a bunch of other videos too and there's just a lot of history out there and a lot of ground to cover so it's kind of fun to deep dive into all that stuff and educate yourself so that you can have a better understanding of where all these amps came from and how they developed into what they are today i really wish i could cover all that in this video but I don't have time, and I'm sure you guys would probably not want to watch a freaking Encyclopedia Britannica version of a video. So let's go ahead and do a one-take mix and uh, see how it sounds in a full mix. Well, there you have it. A quick history on how amps have changed over the last several decades and how different they sound from where they started. Now, in my opinion, we live in the golden era of gear. I mean, we live in the best times. I mean, we have everything available to us. I mean, from even the, the classic amplifiers, you can still get those. They're still making a lot of those today and you can still buy them on the used market all the way up to all the modern stuff and even the digital stuff. I mean, there's just so much great gear out there these days. And I mean, we're just spoiled and it's just fun to be able to 
check all this stuff out and see what we like best. And, and if you're a collector, I mean, why not have something from each era at least and be able to, uh, you know, walk down the old memory lane with some of these and enjoy the nostalgic tones and all the great stuff that the uh, older amps have to offer. And if you just want to freaking blow the roof off your house, play something like a Stealth and or a Diesel Herbert or whatever, you know, and just enjoy the hell out of that too. So uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to experience all of these different amplifiers and share my experiences with you guys. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you want to learn more, I mean, man, there's so many videos on YouTube about this. I mean, there's so much information that, you know, I said it a million times I left out of this video but uh, there's just a lot of great info out there and it was really fun for me to uh, educate myself uh, and brush up on some of this stuff so that I could do this video for you guys so I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I hope you enjoyed that mix yep made a few mistakes there but it's a one take mix and that's how I do things from now on and it's just the way it is. So anyways, to all my Patreon supporters and subscribers, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you guys. And if you want to support my channel, feel free to join my Patreon. Their link is below. Or go to my website, also link below, and get some awesome amp tones for Tonex, Kemper, or Quad Cortex. And I know you're going to really like those tones. I've gotten a lot of great feedback on them, and people are really enjoying them. So, And thanks to all the people who are buying those. I really appreciate that. It does go a long way to support the channel. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done that yet. I would really appreciate that because i got a lot of great stuff coming up for you guys, and I'll see you on the next one.